Let me read a couple of very well-known verses from Romans chapter 1, Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome. He says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress or hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's verses 18 through 20. And God's objection to man is not that he doesn't know God, but that God has given him convincing evidence so that he should know God. You know, I often think that Christians are skittish about engaging in this issue of science. And, you know, we have to realize, first of all, that modern science was discovered by people who believed in a law-ordered universe because they believed in a supreme lawgiver that the God who gave us the Bible in an orderly way, line upon line, precept upon precept, is the same God who gave us an orderly universe. And just as there are moral laws in our world, so there were natural laws which could be discovered because God had revealed it to us. And, you know, science speaks to the idea of a creator. Everything in our world has a cause and effect relationship. And when we see the universe as the effect, we know that the cause has to be far greater than that. But you know, science is the friend of pro-life. The further people go in their research, the more they realize this little life inside the womb has a heartbeat. Within a very short period of time, they see the little baby smiling, sucking its thumb, recognizing voices, and we realize that uh, the further they go, the more they realize, no, this is murder if we terminate what they call a fetus, which is a child that God is giving life to. You know, science is clear about the two genders. So if you have a Y chromosome, you, you're a male, and if you don't, you're a female. And so many of the things that people argue about in the moral realm actually have good scientific evidence. And God has given this to us to bolster our confidence in him and to understand that just as there are physical laws in our universe, the law of gravity seems to be fairly consistent wherever you are on the planet. So there are moral laws, and uh, if you step off the top story of a 10-story building, you don't break the law of gravity, it breaks you. And so it is with God's moral law. People don't break the law, it breaks them. And the scripture says the way of the transgressor is hard. Well, some years ago, uh, many years ago now, I was visiting a group of Christians up considerably north of the city of Toronto, way up in a gold mining town in northern Ontario. And there were a few students who were the best students in the science class, and they were ready to graduate. And they went to their teacher and said, we have endured all of this evolutionary talk all the way through school, and once before we graduate, we would like, just once, to have someone come in and give the other side of the issue. He said, look, I don't want religion in my science class. And they said, no, this will be science. And uh, so he asked to meet with me. I was visiting there, and they asked if I would come and do this. I went and met with him, and he was still very nervous. And I said, listen, you can set up a video camera. You can shoot everything I say so that if any parents are upset, they can watch the video and see that I've been talking science the whole time. And so it was arranged. I began and I explained to them that evolution is not in the world today. You can't see it. And what we're talking about, of course, is not mutations, but the transmutation of species moving from one species to another, the increasing of sophistication and complexity simply by random chance working on mindless matter and somehow going from goo to you. And so I said, it's not in the natural world. It's not in theoretical science. It can't be proven by, by science. And so I began to 
deconstruct the arguments that are often used. And we talked about the experiments at Max Planck Institute and why, because of stereoisomers, that was an impossibility, that actually what they proved in that experiment was that there has to be intelligence behind the universe. They had to build filters into the system so that they actually could produce these simple amino acids. We talked about a lot of things and in the end, when I finished, uh, the teacher came up to the front and he said, well, Mr. Nicholson, um, you pretty much made it impossible for me to teach evolution to this class. But he said, um, you know, we're given this particular model and, you know, we know it, it may not be true, but we're obligated to teach it anyway. I said, wow. I said, you know, I don't think there's any other class in the school where the teacher would confess you it's probably not true, but we're obligated to teach it anyway. And I said, you know, I didn't use any particular model because evolutionists are famous for this. As soon as you talk about one area, they change their mind and say, oh, well, never mind. What about this? And they keep moving things around. They're like many of the cults. And so I didn't use that. I said, there are only two models, right? It happened on purpose or it happened by accident. And if it happened by accident, then you're just an accident and I'm an accident and there's nothing we can be sure of at all. John Lennox quotes atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel who says, evolutionary naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism itself depends. That's exactly right. If my mind is simply a random collection of atoms synapses misfiring, there's no reason to believe that anything I say, anything I think has any value at all. So we finished up our little study and I said to him, listen, I'm here because of these kids. I'm here for you. If you have any questions, I would love to talk to you afterwards because in the end, the issue is not so much science. The issue is our own hearts, our relationship to God. That's what's important. And if this is a barrier in the way of people seeking after God because they think that science has disproven God, I'm here to show you that no, science actually points to God. Anyway, he said, now the physics teacher would like to talk with you. Well, class was over. We went down or a group of them followed me down to this class with the physics teacher and he immediately began to argue about geology. And I said, you know, it's interesting to me. I was up in the biology class and he wanted to argue chemistry. And now I'm in the physics class. And you want to argue uh, geology. I said, why don't you argue physics? That's what you know. And explain to me how these laws of thermodynamics, the idea of increasing randomness, not increasing order in the universe, and, and the impossibility of creating energy, usable energy. You know, we have the law of creation and the law of the fall in these two laws of thermodynamics. Explain to me how that works with evolution. It doesn't. It works actually the opposite of evolution. So anyway, he fussed around a little bit. And finally, I said, listen, here's why I'm here at the school. You see these young people here? At one end of this school, they're telling these students, you have worth and value and purpose, and please don't commit suicide. Because one of the top reasons for these young people dying is through suicide. Meanwhile, in your class, you're telling them they're just random acts. There is no purpose. There is no design. And they might as well kill themselves. So I say to them, go kill yourself. And what do you say to them? Give them a reason not to do it. Well, he kind of looked down and fussed around, didn't know what to say. And I wasn't going to help him. The students weren't going to help him. And finally, in a little voice, he said, you know, um, for years, I've, I've thought that there probably was a God, but I didn't have the courage to say it in my class. Hmm. I said, you know, these kids are worth more than the whole world to God. And God has revealed himself in scores of ways, in conscience, in creation, in history, in the Bible, in the incarnation of Christ, in the testimony of believers, there's more than enough evidence. 
And it turned out that actually he had had an emotional distressing time because of his sister who had been involved in some false cult and become fanatic. And he simply had an emotional reaction against Christianity that had nothing to do with evidence at all. Anyway, we had quite an interesting discussion and all these young people listening to this, uh, some time went by and um, I had gone back home and then I had returned to another group of Christians also within an hour or two of this town. And I got a call from one of the elders there who was a father of one of the young people who got me into the class and three cheers for their courage in doing this to get me in there. Anyway, he said that biology teacher is dying of cancer only has days to live. I borrowed a car, I drove over, I went to the hospital, I walked into the room, he was just skin and bones. I, I wouldn't have recognized him. I said, hi, do you remember me? He said, yeah, I couldn't forget you. I said, well, tell me, sir, how are your theories doing now? He said, they're bankrupt. I said, would you like to hear a little good news from the Bible? He said, I'm listening. And so very simply, I shared with him the gospel. And he thanked me and turned his face to the wall as if to say, I, I want to think about this. A few days later, he called up this elder and said he'd like to meet him. And the elder went in to see him. And he said, I'd like you to take my funeral. <laughs> the elder said, what would I ever say? And he handed him a letter and said, maybe this will help. And in it, he confessed that though he had had many doubts about his evolution and believed that there was a God behind the universe, he hadn't confessed it to his students. But right on the brink of eternity, he had received Christ as his personal savior. You know, almost the whole high school came to the funeral and that brother was able to get up and read that testimony and declare that within a heartbeat of hell, the man had cried out to God for mercy and God had saved him. We don't try to argue people into salvation, but sometimes these things are impediments to people to even begin to listen to the gospel. And so we are encouraged to be ready to give an answer for the hope within us, but always to point people to the Lord Jesus. The real issue is not evolution versus creation. The real issue is the new creation. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. And that's what we long for. May the Lord encourage you. Uh, you don't have to be clever. You don't have to be an expert. But you can point to the evidence that's been provided and say, you know, this has been a huge help to me. I'm not, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. But I do know this, that when I look out at this universe, it speaks to me about a designer. And when I look into my own heart, I see the need of someone to save me, to rescue me, to change me. And the Bible says that the ultimate proof is when we put our trust in Christ and he changes us. And if we believe the evidence God has given, we become evidence to the transformed life.